So good morning. Um, so we'll, we'll keep pick up where we left yesterday. So yesterday, what we did was we we looked at um, at the transport problem for from a very pictorial point of view. We understood more or less um, how electrons flow through a device via um, a rate equation. Then we devised another. Uh, approach, which use a tight binding kind of approach uh, to understand uh, transport from a transmission point of view. So we, at the very end, what I said was that uh, we could understand transport as a scattering problem. And so what I'm going to do today is actually try to unify these two theories, or these two approaches, into a quantitative method to calculate electronic transport. Um, in principle, what I'm going to derive here is non-interacting. However, uh, what I I'm going to do or I'm going to say is that although the derivation is going to be non-interacting, uh, the equations that we get at the end can be used to calculate the interacting transport. And what I, what I mean by interacting transport is something that goes beyond uh, a mean field approach. So in the very end, at the very last lecture, then I'll introduce some forms of interaction and also do uh, something that goes beyond the tight binding approach to go something to do, for example, using uh, density functional theory so that you can do uh, quantitative predictions. So that's, that's the story that, that I plan to, to do for the next two lectures. Um, so just picking up where I left, um, so yesterday what we said was, okay, so I solve a problem of a, of a chain of atoms and in that particular chain of atoms, ev all the atoms and all the couplings were identical. And, and so the conductance was equal to a quantum of conductance. So 2e squared over h. Now, um, since I said that the problem is a scattering problem, then I can do a scattering approach to calculate the transmission on a, on a system where I change one of the, uh, one of the, one of the couplings, for example, to introduce a scattering center. So now, it's not that everybody's the same. There's a slight difference in my problem. Uh, I broke translational symmetry uh, here. So in principle, the full solution for the wave function is not just a simple uh, block state, but it's a, a, a block, uh, block wave function. But it's, uh, it's going to be something slightly more complicated. So uh, again, I go back to my very simple problem. If I had uh, if I had the system in a in a periodic chain, then the solution would be this one. But if I break it, or if I think that there is some uh, some something different in the middle, what I can do is I can write this problem as a scattering problem, and so I have an incoming wave, uh, a backscattered uh, part of the wave, which is here. So it's just uh, something with uh, crystal momentum which is opposite from the incoming one. And then I have also uh, combinations on the other side of waves going that way and waves going this way. Right, so in principle what I can do is build a solution for the total wave function of the system uh, based on, on uh, these solutions here. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do. And you can propose a solution and uh, for the for the total wave function, which is on the left hand side, uh, it's a combination of an incoming wave with a reflected part for the uh, reflected uh, wave and a transmitted part of the wave function, which has a, a t, which is for this for this transmission. Okay. And then all I need to do then is to prove that this wave function is a solution to the uh, to the Schrodinger equation of this problem. So basically what I do is I propose a solution, I need to solve for R and T, and I solve the Schrodinger equation on this basis of, of orbitals. So it's a, it's a rather simple problem. It's uh, somewhat similar to the, the real space approach that you do in, in, uh, in undergraduate physics. Uh, the transmission looks uh, something like this, um, which looks a little bit like a beast, but uh, it, it's a rather simple uh, uh, calculation and if you consider that uh, gamma is um, quite small compared to beta which is where beta is the electron so what I'm saying is that 
I have a um, a a very wide band uh, mantle on this side, a very wide band on this side, and then I put a small constriction in the middle, so I'm you know it's very weak coupling between these two. Then I come up with a with a situation like this. Now. Uh, you can clearly see that if I if I make beta equal to uh, gamma squared, then the transmission probability is equal to one, right? So you recover the 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 exact solution, the the, the ideal case solution, but you get a, a a description like this one here for the sine squared. Okay, so uh, how does this look like? For example, for a choice of 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 epsilon zero, so epsilon zero would be my on-site energy. And this is my, my gamma, so I get peaks in the transmission. So what I'm seeing here is varying the values of gamma, right? So varying, varying the values of, of, the, um, of, the, of the coupling, then obviously I get, whenever I reach gamma 0 equal to 1, I always get one quantum of conductance. And then uh, I get different values of transmission. So you can clearly see this sine squared uh, behavior over here. For the for the transmission, um, okay. So, so this is this is a, a the problem of a of a scattering center. Let's say if I have a, a multiple probe problem. So let's say that I actually want to simulate something that looks like this. So I have a chain of atoms. Say for example, here what I'm going to do is maybe I have a surface, and I have I want to bring. Uh, another chain on top of this one, like this. And this is going to be a very simple one-dimensional one, but what I would like to simulate is something like you come with a metal tip and you come to the surface of a, a two-dimensional surface. Now here I'm going to uh, make it a si the problem simpler by simulating a one-dimensional uh, uh, system, but in principle I could do the same for the, for the two-dimensional case. And then I bring this metal tip, and I want to calculate is the current flowing from or into this metal tip onto this surface here, right? Which I'm uh, simplifying by a one-dimensional chain. Okay, so what I'm going to have is that current is going to flow from the tip into the chain, and it's going to be flowing then both in this direction and this direction, or the opposite direction, so I'm flowing from the surface into the tip. Um, and I would like to understand what's happening here. I can use the same type of scattering approach to uh, understand this problem. It's slightly more complicated because now what I have to do is, okay, I have a, a guy here which can be considered to be localized, but then I have a semi-infinite chain of atoms in this, in this direction, I have a semi-infinite chain of atoms in this direction, and then I have another semi-infinite chain of atoms here. Uh, so, the problem is slightly more complicated because I, can cons I have to consider that, for example, in this case, I'm going co to consider that electrons are flowing from the chain over in this direction and this direction. So it's coming in. There's a part that is being reflected, and then there's a part that is being transmitted in this, a part that is being transmitted here, and then I have a localized state in the middle. So, okay, it's slightly more complicated because now you have four variables, but you can solve exactly in the same way. Uh, and you get a transmission coefficient that uh, now, because I have uh, different uh, incoming and outgoing uh, materials, so the materials are different, so I have to consider that uh, perhaps, uh, let's let me go back here, perhaps the coupling here might be different from the coupling here, so I want to uh, conserve flux, so in actual fact, the total transmission is not just the square of these uh, t's here, but it is also weighted by the uh, group velocities, both from the incoming and the outgoing uh, waves. But still, I mean, the transmission is still given by, by uh, a factor like this, so yeah, I'm summing over all the possible channels that the electrons can flow into. Uh, and if I approximate again that the coupling is quite small between my surface and my tip, then I get a transmission that looks a lot like this one here. Now, if I, if I uh, think about the density of states of a one-dimensional chain of atoms, then this density of states, 
for this one-dimensional chain actually looks like this. So it's a si one over sine of the uh, crystal momentum. And so if you, for the one-dimensional system, the density of states look like this, right? So this is one over sine of Ka, which is exactly uh, this term here, right? So we have a transmission that uh, is represented by the density of states of the surface. Uh, I can also calculate the density of states of a semi-infinite chain, and the density of states of a semi-infinite chain is actually given by a sine, not one over sine, of this quantity. So if I put this back in, in there, what I get is that the transmission depends on the coupling squared, the density of states of my surface, and the density of states of my tip. Right. Okay, so what, I, what did I do here with this very simple problem is actually to try to simulate or to give you an idea of the type of things that you would see in an experiment done by an STM, right? Because in an STM, what you have is you have a metallic tip on a surface, and you're measuring the tunneling current between this tip and the surface. And if you look at it, uh, why is the STM giving you information about, why is this current giving you information about the, the structure of, of your system is because the transmission is given exactly by the density of states of the system, but it requires that you have some knowledge of the density of states of the tip, right? So typically you consider that the tip is a, is a very, very good metal, so uh, this density of states is, uh, in the wideband limit is almost a constant, right? So you have information measuring the current, you have information about the density of states of your of your surface, and that's basically how a, 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 a an STM works. And this is essentially uh, what you get if you do uh, Tersov-Hamann, right? So the Tersov-Hamann theory is not derived this way, but essentially what Tersov-Hamann uh, is saying is that uh, the current that is flowing from the tip or out of the tip into an STM is a convolution between the tip density of states and the density of states of your metallic surface. So it's interesting because uh, what we did was, you know, in a very simple way, understand what's happening in an experiment, right? Um, obviously, in an experiment, you apply a bias. You have to sum over all the states, uh, all the energies that are between the, 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 the ground and this bias that you're applying. But essentially, what you're measuring or what you're trying to access is the density of states of the electron states of your, of your surface, right? So uh, ignoring the, the, the conduct, the, the tip, or at least uh, you have to know somehow what is the, the structure of your tip. Now somebody might say, okay, but um, I if you're talking about tunneling, where is the tunneling part considering that if you're consider t talking about tunneling, then there should be some exponential term in your, uh, in your, in your transmission or in your current that is associated with the distance between the tip and the surface, right? So here, no, there's no explicit exponential term between the, the, the tip and the surface. Actually, this exponential term is in the gamma, in the sense that if you think about, for example, two hydrogen atoms, right, which are um, a hydrogen atom, the one S state of the hydrogen atom, for example, has an exponential tail. So if you think about uh, the overlap between two hydrogen atoms or the the coupling between two hydrogen atoms, then uh, you can assume that this this uh, interaction is somewhat exponential. So that's where the exponential tail is coming from here. So there will be a, an exponential dependence of gamma with the distance between the tip and the and the surface. Okay, so um, so with this, we are almost ready to start with a more quantitative approach where we can uh, derive uh, from from uh, the Schrodinger equation, the current operator. But before I do that, I just wanted to uh, say this. So we did everything from uh, from a, a, a microscopic point of view. Uh, but I would like to to say that I can recover uh, Ohm's law if I go to a uh, to a system with a large number of scatters. So 
what I, we assume is that if you have a diffusive uh, regime, then you should have something that scales. Uh, the conductance, the conductance should scale with the area and should scale with the length of the device. Uh, here we started from a theory where our scattering length is typically larger than the device itself, so we have only a few scattering events. But I would like to uh, somehow reconstruct my theory so that this theory that we did up to now is consistent with uh, a macroscopic approach or understanding what we would have if we have a large number of scatters um, in, in built in this uh, idea of scattering with transmission and reflection. So uh, this is exactly what I, what, I, what I plan to do now before we move on. And, and the whole idea is the following. So let's imagine that we have a scattering center and the, uh, we have an incoming electron this electron then has a probability of transmission, a probability of being reflected. And now we introduce an extra scattering center. And then what we would have is that if we have these two uh, scattering centers one after the other, then again, there would be, uh, a, the electron would come in, there will be some form of reflection, there will be part of a, a transmission. And so if we start including different scatterers, then, um, then we should expect uh, to have a lot of, of this back and forth transmission and reflection events. Okay. okay. The problem is that if I consider that um, there is some, some uh, transmission from this e event here, and then I consider that this guy now that is being transmitted is going towards this other scatterer, and so the transmission in a very intuitive way, I would say, okay, so then the transmission probability of the electron being scattered again should be the product of these two transmissions. Uh, the problem is that this is not really truly the case here because what we have is something like, uh, like a, a electromagnetic wave trapped inside a medium with a different uh, uh, refraction index, right? So you have actually considered the fact that there is a, a backscattered uh, solution here. And so, in actual fact, we need to solve this in, in terms of outgoing waves, ingoing waves. These waves actually can, um, can uh, interfere with each other. And so, the total transmission is actually not the product of these ones. We have to consider something uh, like this. So, there is actually a probability that the part of the wave will be reflected, part of the wave will be reflected again. So the total transmission is actually a combination of this uh, transmission here and also a combination of reflections coming from uh, the previous reflection that this wave here was actually reflected back. And so there is a, a probability that the electron, this guy, is reflected, then reflected again, and then transmitted, and so on and so forth. Um, so if you do this, Actually, the total combination of this, uh, this guy here is given by, by something like this. Uh, you can go on, so it's, there's kind of a, an infinite series here. Um, but you can rewrite this as, as uh, this quantity here. Um, so the total transmission can be uh, request, recast in this form. And, um, and so if I rewrite everything, then uh, and I consider that I have an, a number of scatters. Now I have a, an n scatters. Uh, all of them are the same, just for simplicity. Then uh, I get something uh, like this. So it there's a dependence on the av average length of my of my system. Um, and so the total conductance now is given by the number of channels that I had times the 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 transmission, the number of channels, I can assume that this number of channels now is proportional to the area. And if this is the case, then uh, uh, I will get something that looks like the Ohm's law, right? So there is a dependence on length and there's a dependence on area. So that's, uh, that is recovered in this very simple system. So I can recover the, the um, uh, Ohm's law, if I go back to this diffusive regime where I have a very large number of scatters 
and the scatters are going uh, moving back and forth, provided I have a very large number of channels. Okay, so uh, something is seems to be right, or at least we we go back. We can go back to the macroscopic scale. So let's now uh, go back to the beginning. So what I want to do now is to really uh, derive the equations of motion of my problem uh, starting from a very complicated Hamiltonian for a system where I have not even necessarily just one electrons coming in from one probe and leaving from another, but in principle I could have multiple probes. And so what I'm going to do is, in principle, the problem I want to solve if I look at a single particle picture, is I have a Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian originally is a Hamiltonian with uh, no, uh, no interaction with the potential, so there's no external potential. This Hamiltonian is what I would call simple, in the sense that I know how to solve the problem for this particular Hamiltonian, H0. And then I introduce some form of coupling or some external potential V of Q that makes this, this problem much more complicated and for which I don't really know how to solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So if I know how to solve this simpler problem here, then I can write a Green's function approach for this particular problem, right? So instead of, of solving for the wave function, I can solve this uh, differential equation for the Hamiltonian for the Green's function. And uh, um, in principle, I can then use this solution for the, for the, the Green's function to try to solve for the full problem. So I try what I'm really looking for is this wave function for the, for the full problem. I can do uh, some algebra uh, for this Green's function uh, in this fun Green's function problem. So essentially what I have is a, a differential equation. I have a, a Green's function now that uh, represents the, the simplified problem. I can rewrite everything in this, uh, this simplified form. And uh, doing a little bit of algebra, I get to an equation, which is an integral equation, for the wave function that I'm trying to solve. And it, it, what I mean by the integral equation is that um, my wave function actually depends on an integral of the wave function itself, which means, okay, so I had a complicated problem, I solve an easier one, then I put it back in, and I get a much more complicated looking problem, right? Because I need to solve for this, uh, for this guy here with, uh, with um, some dependence on itself. Okay, so apart from very simple uh, potentials, uh, external potentials, this is not really simple at all, right? Because uh, this you cannot really reorganize this equation to solve for, for a psi. Uh, however, what I can do is I can uh, say this. Okay, let's say to first order uh, the the, the wave function that I put in here is actually the original wave function for the non-interacting problem. So the, the problem with no, uh, no V0, no, no V applied. Then I can uh, solve this problem to first order and I get an approximation, which is uh, an approximation to uh, Psi. And this is usually known as, as the firstborn approximation. So I have a, uh, a, a problem where I introduce a scatterer V and I solve for this scatter v, assuming that my, uh, my wave function can be approximated by the original wave function plus some uh, correction to this, uh, to this uh, scattering event. I can do the next step, which would be, okay, now I have an approximation for psi, I can plug psi back into this equation now with this new approximation, and then I get a second order term, so I get the original one and I get a second order term, and you can do this onwards and onwards and onwards in, prin in principle. Uh, and the good thing is, in principle, if V is small, then what you have is a perturbation theory, right? Because 
this depends on v, this depends on v squared, and so on and so forth, and you can uh, uh, do this, this, uh, this expansion. Uh, however, what I'm going to do is, well, first of all, I'm going to do uh, introduce time. So what I, what I can do is, instead of solving the Schrodinger equation uh, for the stationary case, what we can do is we can solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And things will be similar. The only difference here is that now I introduce a time derivative. I solve for the Green's function now that the Green's function depends not on only on R and R prime, but it depends on T and uh, T prime. Um, and I do exactly the same. I can expand this into in terms of a of a um, um, do an exp a series expansion. And uh, to simplify things, what I'm going to do is, okay, so instead of doing this in real space, I can go to, um, to any operator form. So the Green's function becomes an operator, not a function of R and R prime. So I'm not really projecting on, on uh, any particular uh, basis. And so things become much simpler in the sense that uh, I can write it in a much smaller uh, kind of structure. So I have a solution now which is the first uh, order, and then uh, I can plug it in and, and solve for the for, for the for the, the full problem. Okay. Um, so if I do this thing recursively for this uh, for this particular structure, uh, I can r actually write down everything in a very nice closed form, right? And if I if I look at this guy. Uh, this is like a series uh, where the Green's function for the full problem is actually a series that depends on the operations of coupling the Green's function of the non-interacting system with this uh, operator V, which is the, the scattering center. And I can rewrite everything in this, in this way. So since it's an infinite series, I can uh, uh, do some, some very simple algebra, put G0 over times V in evidence, and this rewrite again. And this is the G itself. So I get to something that uh, is called the Dyson equation. Now, even though this looks very, very nicely, I have to remember that if I project onto, like for example, the basis of, of, uh, the, the of real space, for example, we have a series of integrals here, and then actually there is a dependence on G and not G naught, right? So, um, it's a it's a very nice closed form, but in, in actual fact, it's it's basically what we're doing is rewriting this operation here in this uh, very nice closed form. So there's still a problem of actually calculating this Green's function for the interacting system. I just rewrote it in a very nice, uh, very beautiful way. Okay, so for the case where uh, our v has no time dependence, uh, the Green's function is actually much simpler. Uh, there is a, I can define uh, two solutions for my Green's function, which is one which has a step function where for t greater than t prime, um, and then one which is t prime greater than t. So there's uh, two different uh, solutions for my problem. It's a little bit like uh, uh, when you solve a Green's function for the free electron, there's a solution for r greater than r prime and r, greater, uh, r smaller than r prime. Um, Okay, now we did this for the very simple uh, one-body problem. We can actually calculate everything that we did here in a basis of, of many-body states. Right? So I can define a basis of many-body states and then uh, redo the same, the, same, uh, the same things, right? So I can rewrite, recast my, my tight binding model, for example, in a in a creation and relation operator form. Uh, so that would be easier for me, for example, to introduce interactions. So here I have the exact same problem that I had with the single body uh, Hamiltonian, and this is still a single body Hamiltonian, but I, I can in principle now include uh, many body effects, like for example, uh, a Hubbard term uh, for, the, for the Hubbard model, for, for instance. Um, so this is, this is what I, I, I'm going to do now, but remembering that uh, the operators that we have that have the same form, the single particle operators that we're going to use are have the same form either in using a single particle Hamiltonian or this uh, Fox space uh, representation. Okay, 
So uh, I recast this Green's function. The Green's functions that I defined before were are known as the retarded Green's function and the, the advanced Green's function. And this is exactly associated with the fact that uh, you have this uh, T and T prime are either, uh, there's a correction that should be here. This is uh, T prime minus T instead of T prime here. Um, and this is exactly associated with the fact that you have uh, one uh, Green's function we have is, this is T is greater than T prime or T is either zero for t greater than t prime or, or uh, zero for t lower than t prime. And then I define two other Green's functions uh, for this problem, which uh, they're how they look like will become evident in a, in a second. But um, here, so what we see here is that this Green's function can be represented as an average of the commutator or the anti-commutator operation for these creation and annihilation operations. Here, this Green's function, which is the we define as a greater Green function, is an average uh, of the uh, creation and annihilation operators only. And this one here is the lesser Green's function, which we'll be talking a lot, is uh, given by the, the this product at different times. So essentially what we're saying here is that this is an average of destroying an electron or destroying a particle at time t and on site A and creating a T prime on site J. Okay, uh, so how can we understand these these uh, these new operations that uh, that uh, that we have? So basically, the retarded and the advanced Green's functions are solutions to the Schrodinger equation of my problem, right? So I can say that it could be the solution to the Schrodinger equation uh, with um, with interaction or no interaction, then it would be G0 or, or G, right? Now, these guys here uh, are something slightly different. So they actually contain information about uh, the distribution of the electrons in the sense that while the retarded advanced Green's function in principle, uh, in, in within this picture that we define, they have no... Uh, uh, direct information about temperature, right? Here, uh, what we have is that these guys here are actually the effective distribution of particles and holes in your in your system uh, with uh, depending on temperature. So what we're doing there is an average, which is actually the statistical average of of my problem. And so if we look at this in a basis of eigenstates of my Hamiltonian, then this is how this guy looks like. So in actual fact, I'm summing over, and then I have a, a Boltzmann weight that basically is telling me uh, how I populate my states. Uh, so if I do a, a Fourier transform of this problem, then I can get uh, something like this. And you can clearly see basically what I'm doing here is I'm summing over all the states uh, for, for this particular system with energy E. Right. And so Whenever this difference here is equ is equal to to uh, omega, then that's that's when I have a uh, I populate my my system. Uh, similar thing for this last surge Green's function, and so this is the how how it looks like. Uh, here should be lesser actually. Um, and if I define a spectral function for my problem. And the spectral function is essentially the imaginary part of my uh, retarded Green's function. Uh, what I can say is that whenever I am at equilibrium, the, the, uh, this lesser Green's function is essentially uh, the, the spectral function times the, the Fermi distribution. So this is, a s I in a sense, what this is telling me is is a form of a, a theorem that was mentioned yesterday uh, in the in the thermal transport uh, talk, which is a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So what it's what is telling me here is that this uh, quantity here uh, can be associated with the spectral function and the the Fermi distribution, and the spectral function is nothing more than at, equ at equilibrium. The spectral function is nothing more than the density of states, right? So basically what I'm saying here is that 
if I integrate, this guy is basically the sta uh, density of states weighted by the Fermi distribution. So if I integrate this guy, what I get is the occupation of my system. So this, uh, this lesser Green's function can actually be associated with my population of, of electrons or population of particles in the, in the problem. At equilibrium, it's just the number of particles that are populating my... my, my at equilibrium is just the the, the density. Uh, at out of equilibrium, I can assume that it's an out of equilibrium density. Uh, okay, so this is basically this. So the spectral function is the density of states. Uh, if I have non-interacting particles, um, and okay, so with this, with these four Green's functions, with this picture of 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 uh, of of distributions, then what I want to do is I want to calculate transport because basically up to now what I did is I have a system, I solve the Schrodinger equation or I try to solve the Schrodinger equation, I populate the states of this of the system if I know how to diagonalize it, and um, and this could be out of equilibrium or in equilibrium, but if if I can solve the problem, then in principle I can get any quantity including current. But uh, I didn't really specify a, a system, so I, I first of all we need to calculate or define a problem where transport is actually something that is important. And so this is this is the, the type of problem that uh, we want to talk about is a scattering region. Up to now we had just you know electrodes coupling to some some scattering center. Uh, here I could have as many uh, electrodes as I would like. Uh, for example, here I have four, but it could, in principle, be as many as as, as is necessary. Um, these uh, each of these systems are coupled to the central scattering region by some potential V1, Vc. Uh, so this is V1, C, V2C, V3C, and uh, so on and so forth. And I can write a Hamiltonian for this for this problem. So this Hamiltonian could be written in a in a um, in a Representation of, of creation and relation operators where I have uh, a part of the Hamiltonian is the uh, Hamiltonian for uh, the central region. I have a part of the Hamiltonian for the electrodes, so my leads. I have a part of the Hamiltonian that is coupling the electrodes to uh, the central region. Uh, so basically the, the two terms, the Hamiltonian for the central region and the Hamiltonian for the leads, are basically creation and relation operators on these on these uh, sites. Now I'm assuming that here I am in the basis that diagonalizes these guys independently. Um, and then I have a, a tunneling Hamiltonian that takes me from either the lead to the scattering region or the scattering region to the lead. So I have these two these two terms here. Right, one is creating in the lead and and uh, and removing from the central region, the other one is removing from the central region and creating the lead. Uh, okay, so this is the problem I would like to solve. And the current, uh, I can calculate the current as the average change in number of particles, right? So this is, this is the time derivative of the uh, density of particles at some time t uh, and then I can choose that if the current is, um, or I, can, I can want to calculate the current, I can calculate the current in, for example, any of the electrodes. So what I'm trying to say is that, well, if I'm at steady state, wherever I calculate the currents, all the current, the current should be conserved. But uh, uh, here, if I'm some, some time derivative, what I'm doing is I'm calculating the current at some point in my system so I'm calculating the current, for example, that is flowing from the central region into a particular uh, electrode. So it's the change of particles from one particular electrode into the, the central region. And so this is what I define as my, as my uh, density operator in this case, is uh, you, cr you remove a particle from, uh, say, lead alpha, and you, cr and you create it in, in, uh, in site L, and so on and so forth. And again, what we can do is we say that the current then is the average of the commutative relation between the, the uh, density operator and the total Hamiltonian. 
Now the, the whole point here is that this guy here does not commute with H. Uh, so because it does not commute with H, then there will be a current. So okay, so we can do again go back to our to our Green's functions uh, that that we have defined, uh, the retarded in advanced Green's functions. We can then place these guys in our in our current, and then because we're taking these averages, uh, what shows up here is exactly those uh, those guys that we defined uh, previously. So we we get the Lasser uh, Green's function for in this case uh, the the coupling between the the term that couples between my electrode and my central region, right? And times this uh, operator here, which is exactly the coupling between the, the, the two. Right? So, th so this is my definition of the current. It's going to be uh, uh, a trace. If I do a, um, I can do a, um, uh, a Fourier transform to go to spectral, uh, to the to the spectral representation. Um, so the, the the frequency representation. And so the current will be an integral over the trace of this operator here, which uh, we could say, okay, now we're done, right? But um, le let's look at this guy here. First of all, I mean, this guy is very complicated to calculate, but uh, we can clearly see that we already have here a rate equation in the sense that what we're doing here is we're calculating uh, how much elect how many electrons are going. We're, we're Taking the difference between whatever goes out of the of the of the system and whatever comes in, right? and this will give us the current. So uh, somehow there is already uh, a relationship between what we did yesterday for the the very simple problem and what we have here for this uh, kind of, in principle, much more complicated uh, uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, so we have an inflow of electrons, an outflow, and we would like to do is I would like to rewrite this problem in a in a kind of more treatable way, and what I what I need to do first of all I'm I'm going to do is I want to remove time from from uh, this uh, this equation to read something like this, and in order to do that then I have to do an integral over time. This is not a very simple thing. You have to, one possible way is actually to choose a, to, to go to the complex plane and then do a, a contour integral. Um, and there are different approaches to do this, uh, but one particular approach is to choose uh, the so-called co uh, Caldish contour. And then you can actually write uh, in this Caldish contour, you can get write uh, the evolution of the Green's functions for both the uh, the retarded and the advanced. I can also write the evolution for the Green's function for the non-interacting case. Um, so what I call the non-interacting case is the case without that coupling. So this is an operation for the electrode isolated electrode, each of the electrodes, and then the isolated uh, uh, central scattering region. And I have, I can rewrite this into, in the form of a, of a Dyson equation again, uh, in this contour. And, and so we can actually use a set of rules known as Langreth, Langreth rules to uh, couple these uh, retarded and advanced uh, or uh, Lesser operators in uh, in in this uh, in this contour, um, and so when we do this, we actually obtain the the retarded and the lesser Green's function in terms of the uncoupled uh, lesser Green's function and the uncoupled retarded Green's functions. Uh, but again, you can clearly see that it's all very nice, but uh, this is still an integral equa uh, uh, equation. So everything is, is still coupled. Um, now, if we do this, now this, uh, these Langerth rules, what I can do is I can actually go from this uh, time, uh, time representation to the spectral representation, so essentially doing a, a Fourier transform. Uh, so I can actually write these, uh, the Lasser-Greens function in this form. 
and the retarded Green's function, which is basically the uh, the Dyson equation. So this is the equivalent of the Dyson equation for the for the lesser Green's function. Okay, now if I look at the coupling, right? So the coupling, f the this this term here, this Green's function times the coupling, which I need to calculate. Um, actually, I can rewrite this not not in terms of the Green's function between the central region and the electrodes, but the Green's function of the central region and the the Green's function of the of the of the electrodes only. So basically what I'm doing here is that using those these rules here, I can rewrite this term and uh, basically I remove the the Green's function between the central region and the scattering region and I write everything in terms of a Green's function for the central region only and a Green's function between the electrodes only and uh, between the couple, the coupling between them. So the coupling between the central and the scattering region. And now this guy here, I can define it as a, as a quantity that we call self-energy. So the self-energy is, is given here. So it's basically the structure or the electronic structure of my l electrode and the coupling between the electronic structure of my electrode and this scattering region. Right. And so this is introducing the effect of the electrode into my problem. Right. So uh, in this way, what I have here is that, okay, I, this term here has the coupling between the electrodes, but all that I need actually is I'm writing this in terms of uh, the effect of the electrodes and focusing only on the scattering region. So all I need now is information about the Green's function of the scattering region with interaction, but still it's a, it's a, it's a much, much closer form. So I can plug this everything back in and uh, rewrite it again. And so what I can do is actually calculate the Green's function with this, uh, with this interaction now in terms of uh, this guy here, which is essentially, again, a Dyson equation. So I have the non-interacting term, the Green's function that I actually want to calculate. And this self-energy here is giving me the interaction between the... Uh, the non-interacting greens non-interacting greens function for the central region with coupled to this to this path of 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 electrons right okay so this means that for example my retarded greens function can be uh recast in a in a very simple form where all the effects of the coupling to the electrodes are included in this guy, which we call a self-energy. Um, so basically what I need to do is I need to solve for, I need to know how to solve the scattering region in principle in an isolated form. And I need to be able to write this uh, self-energy, which is the coupling between the electrodes and the, and the scattering region. Um, okay, so this is the case in particular for a non-interacting Green's, uh, Green's function in the sense that we didn't introduce electron-electron uh, interactions or electron phonon interactions, but still, when we actually introduce uh, interactions, the problem is going to be very similar. Uh, what we can show is that if you introduce a self-energy that accounts for the interaction, then the functional form of your Green's function is the same. Okay, so essentially what you can do is you can couple to, for example, here we couple to a, a electrode, so a bath of electrons that are non-interacting, but in principle I could couple to an interacting bath as well, or to a phonon bath in a, in a sense. So you're introducing the structure of interaction with phonons or interaction with electrons uh, via these self-energies. So uh, what I can do then is, I'll again, go back to my... To my uh, uh, Langreth equations and rewrite my Green's functions or that, that Green function that depended on the coupling and between the, the potential, I can rewrite it again depending only on this uh, self-energy and the Green's function. This is valid 
both for the retarded, the advanced, and the lesser, and the greater of these functions. And so when we do this, uh, my current now, which was written in this form, now can be recast in a slightly different way in the sense that it, it has very similar, uh, something that is very similar, but in a sense, it's uh, simpler because now I have the lesser and the greater Green's functions for the scattering region. So I only uh, need to know the uh, lesser and greatest Green's function for the central scattering region. And these lesser and greater uh, couplings between the scattering region and each one of my electrodes. And this is going to be giving my the current. So I went from a quantity that required me to know this coupling, this Green's function between lead and, and uh, central region and the coupling V here to something that uh, only requires information about the lead itself and the central region itself. Obviously, the information about the coupling is contained in here somewhere. Right? It's just that uh, you can recast it in a, in a form where this is not explicit, but it can be, it can be shown that it's still inside this, uh, this equation. So if the electrodes are in equilibrium, how do these uh, lesser and greater Green's function for the electrodes look like? So, well, I can define this operator gamma, which is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, anti-emission operation of, of these uh, retarded and advanced Green's functions. Um, and I can also calculate if they are in equilibrium, then the lesser and the greater Green's function, as I said, is only uh, the, the uh, spectral function or the density of states of my, of my system multiplied by the Fermi, uh, Fermi distribution. That's the lesser Green's function. The greater Green's function is the, uh, so this would be for the electrons and this would be for the, uh, the holes. So one minus the, the Fermi distribution. Uh, and so the lesser uh, self-energy, it's basically this uh, gamma, uh, populated with the electrons up to some, some uh, chemical potential. And uh, the lesser and the greater Green's function are given by these two guys here. Um, okay, so for the non-interacting case, actually, although we, we have four Green's functions, um, we can reduce this problem to dealing with only one in the sense that the we can relate all of the Green's functions in my problem to either the retarded or the advanced Green's function. So the lesser, the greater, and the, uh, the, the advanced are all related to the retarded or to the advanced Green's function. And so this current here actually reduces to this quantity here. Right. So um, basically, what is this quantity telling me? This quantity is summing over each one of the electrodes. So it's giving me the, cr the contribution to the current on uh, electrode alpha is a, the contribution coming from all the other electrodes that are not alpha. Um, weighted or bound by the Fermi distribution, the difference in Fermi distribution between this electrode alpha and all the different electrodes times this guy here, which is a trace of an operator, which is a coupling uh, gamma with each one of the electrodes and uh, the coupling between the central region and this, uh, this uh, node alpha, and uh, the, the Green's function, the retarded and advanced Green's function. Now, if we go back to our very simple equation for the current that we, de we derived for that very simple problem, we see uh, the similarity. So we see that the problem is bound by the Fermi distribution. We have a quantity here which is called gamma. Obviously, I chose gamma at the very beginning to relate to these two guys here. Uh, and in actual fact, it's not uh, clear here where the one over the sum of the two gammas that I was in the equation before is. But uh, this uh, product of the retardable and the advanced Green function will actually contain that information. In, in them. So there will be uh, a 1 over gamma here, which is exactly the coupling between the, the, the system and the electrodes. Right? Because 
the retarded Green's function is ex exactly uh, containing information about the electrodes here in the self energy, and the gamma is the essentially the complex part of the of this of this self energy. Okay. So we reach an equation which is exactly the same. So we reach an equation that it is giving me a current that is very similar to that very simple model that I that I had before. Right. So we recover the same picture that we had before in our in our uh, in our uh, first approach to transport. At the same time, uh, this tr the trace of this operator here can be associated with a transmission coefficient, right? So basically, this is the landauer butiker transmission coefficient. If we are assuming that uh, my problem actually has no uh, this this guy here has no dependence on on the voltage applied. Now. If there is some dependence on the voltage applied, what we can say is that this is uh, equivalent to the landauer butiker uh, approach, but uh, uh, with some, some dependence on the voltage, which is not, was not usually uh, included in the, original, in the original work. So in principle, what we can do is we can have a Hamiltonian that has some dependence uh, on the voltage, and this obvi obviously changed the, the Green's functions. And this could change the, the total transmission. Uh, okay, so what I'll do is I'll stop here uh, at this equation, which I think is a, is a good time to stop, uh, since we essentially derive uh, the butyrin Landauer current from a completely Green's functions approach. And then we'll continue uh, introducing interactions and doing some more sophisticated uh, DFT calculations for the systems. Thank you.